Welcome to our event tonight. Um, I'm Heather Lorenz. I have the honor to serve on the Northfield Arts and Culture Commission. And um, I'm just gonna ask everybody who's jumping on if you can please mute as you come on. We're gonna keep the focus on Mac. And if you would like to focus on the speaker view, um, I would recommend going up in the upper right uh, icon where it looks like nine dots or a film strip. You're gonna wanna pick where the film strip where it says speaker view because that's what, um, which I'm going to do right now. And so when Mac is talking, he will show up um, large. And if you wanna say something right now, Mac. So oh, no, perfect. welcome okay. everybody. Perfect, good. Oh, and so oh. great, now, you've, now you're on speaker view and so everybody's got you on. <laughs> um, and about uh, 13 months ago, we were celebrating Mac um, at the Living Treasure Awards ceremony, which was held at 50 North. Um, and very soon after that, the pandemic closed everything up. Um, because of the pandemic, uh, Mac's year as the Northfield Living Treasure uh, was extended now through 2021. Uh, Mac Gimsey is a talented figure in sculpture, poetry, and education in our community and around the world. Um, as an educator, he has shared his talents with aspiring artists of all ages. Um, I had the great fortune of taking an art history class from Mac um, during my time at St. Olaf College. Um, in addition to the wonderful Living Treasure Award ceremony in February of 2020, where attendees were able to experience uh, several of Mac's bronze sculptures in person and through Paul Krause's wonderful video, um, Mac, um, Mac and I have also been discussing the possibility of hosting some version of a studio visit or an artist conversation um, during his time as Living Treasure. Uh, during this past year, we've all had to be creative, and this event was no exception. Um, as we planned this artist conversation, we wanted to give it more of a studio visit and less of a PowerPoint presentation feel. Uh, and we wanted to keep it low tech while still allowing everybody who is attending to uh, view the artworks up close. Um, if you RSVP'd, you received five photographs that give you a sense of what um, Mac is gonna be talking about tonight. And it gives you the chance to look at those uh, photos up close and see the details in some of the pieces. Uh, and if you would like to get those pictures, you can email me after um, heather at northfieldartsguild.org um, and I'd be happy to send those pictures to you. Uh, so how is this program gonna to go tonight? Uh, after this introduction, Mac is going to present approximately 20 pieces and going to hold them up close for all of us to see. Uh, that will be followed by an official question and answer session. And then we will conclude the event with Mac reading his most recent poem, Our Future is Still Ahead to Hold. Uh, for tonight's artist conversation, uh, Mac has rigged up a great display that is right in front of his screen. So he's going to show the artworks and the sculptures. And um, this is where if you're just joining on and maybe didn't hear about the speaker view part, um, if you want to see these sculptures up as close as possible, um, switch your view to speaker view because then that'll give you a chance to see what Mac is showing right now. Um, and I will uh, let everybody know that while Mac is presenting, you are welcome to ask questions about uh, the works. You either type in your question in the chat box um, or unmute yourself and ask the question. We want this to be a, like a studio visit kind of feel. So um, I will help moderate those questions. Uh, the heart of Mac's creative work is his unique blend of sculpture and poetry that showcases the ultimate goodness of humankind. I'm so excited that you're all here uh, tonight for Max. Mac Gimsey's 50 year obsession with sculpture from Mac Gets to Metal, um, which will include stories of how his artistic journey started and will demonstrate how his past artworks and current artworks are very relevant today. Um, it is such a treat to be invited virtually into Mac and Jackie's um, home tonight. And Mac recently shared that this is their 50th year um, in their home in Dundas. Um, and he and Jackie just recently celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. So congratulations. Hey. <laughs> uh, Mac will be presenting, um, will be sharing a little bit more about where he is presenting from. Um, and this wide ranging presentation will give us some insights into the scope of Mac's imagination. He states his primary interest has been to be a teacher, create art, collaborate with others and find inspiration in social issues. So please join me in welcoming Mac Gimsey. 
Thank you. <laughs> so please take it away, Matt. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Heather. I, I do want to acknowledge Jackie's uh, presence here because our living room has been unlivable for some time, gathering about 50 pieces of sculpture that our son Chris helped bring up from the basement. And uh, you're not going to see all of them, but it's also part of a, a, a curiously uh, a part of an effort for our St. Olaf archives to have a record of my career at St. Olaf. And I've been interviewed three times by two wonderful student interns who have put material in the archives. So everything that you see here tonight, including Mac, will wind up in the archives. <laughs> kind of where I belong. And it will be all uh, apparently now digital uh, in, in retrieval, which is a wonderful idea. So uh, uh, Jackie, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody's on. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Great, I'll great. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> nice, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I, I only want to comment that uh, Northfield has uh, been our home since 1970. and. Oh, Dundas has officially, but yeah, Northfield and St. Olaf College have really been the essence of our existence, uh, including our two children who are St. Olaf graduates, Gracia and Chris. And uh, when they were three and four years old, we moved into this place, a, a former Methodist church in Dundas that had been vacant for some time, but uh, we moved in, put in a water system, new furnace, uh, upgraded the uh, facilities and you know, immediately we fell in love with the structure and then built it according to the way we felt good about living it. And Jackie and I are just thrilled to still be here. And uh, it, we love the village. And of course uh, we've left it so many times and have come back and people still recognize us. So we're happy for that. The other thing I would like to say straight away is that I see on the screen uh, so many people whom I have loved and admired from family uh, through friends from decades ago to uh, even other uh, some people that I don't think I have uh, met personally yet. So I want to welcome all of you uh, near and far, you know, some students from so many decades ago. I see Linda Atwood there and uh, and, and, oh, and I say, I have very poor name grab. So if I don't get names, uh, that's, I, I call it part of my age, but you know, it's an affliction. Next, uh, I would like to show, according to the instructions I got, uh, were to show kind of how I go about making my sculpture and in, in that sense, also writing the poetry. So, uh, among you, there are people who have seen everything that I have made over the years, including, of course, my sister Shelby. And, and uh, this will be slightly different. I won't be describing each piece in detail, but a little bit of uh, how I got there. And it's, uh, I, I have no way to express my gratitude for being able to do something like this, because it kind of shocks me that I even got started on this, and, and that's a good place to start. And I'll show you the first image. And uh, let's see, Heather, do you put me on full screen? Is that how it goes, or do I put me on full screen? Um, if folks have chosen the speaker view, you are on full screen for folks, so. Oh, okay, yes. good. Yes. Well, then we'll count on it. Well, uh, we were, we were uh, married in 1961. And um, this is my bride at the day of the wedding, but for the next year, uh, in secret, I did a pencil sketch of Jackie that she didn't know about, and it was a gift for our first anniversary. And she saw it, and I don't know if you can tell the, the detail. It really did take me hours and hours and hours with a pencil. Uh, she started telling me that it will not hurt you to take an art course. And uh, I just wanna say that uh, for those who uh, are interested in this sort of thing, it was um, the pencil that I acquired that belonged to William Shakespeare, 
but it was so chewed up that I couldn't tell whether it was to be or not to be. And I hear no laughter, so I'm glad. <laughs> okay. And it's, it's not going to go that way all the way through, I guarantee it. But uh, along, along the way, uh, oh, I took art courses all over uh, the Twin Cities uh, in order to gain enough courses to go to grad school. And I had recommendations from some pretty good people, but uh, let's see, there we are. Uh, one of the courses I took was oil painting from a guy named Clem Hoppers, uh, who was teaching for the U of Minnesota. And this was the son of a friend who was in the course. And Timothy was really happy to pose because he got some of his own money for that. But uh, Clem said after a few paintings like this, uh, he wanted me to stay in his course. I, I hope you can see little Timothy. And uh, that was all very encouraging, but I felt like I was out of range of, uh, of a whole lot of things that would make a big difference as I uh, proceeded. And, uh, but I, I looked uh, back into my graduate days and realized that that drawing in all of its detail really gave me incentive to search for an image. And so I made my first engraving with Mauricio Lasansky. And the strangest thing is that he came by and saw, this is the proof, uh, the final one that Iowa has, the University of Iowa. And uh, he, I heard a pencil break. And the assistant told me that if he saw something in class that he thought was worthy of uh, addressing, he broke his pencil. So see, the pencil is going to dominate here tonight. OK. <laughs> and along the way, I got interested in Chinese art and calligraphy and uh, took a course at the University of Maryland on sabbatical with the National Endowment for the Humanities grant and, uh, in, in Chinese art history. It covered the, the whole realm. But this one was one of the many dozens of calligraphies that I painted. And the uh, teacher came by and she said, keep that one of all of them. So I'm, I'm hanging on, but I love the brush painting. And as folks, um, if you have questions that come up, you feel free to ask them or put them in the chat boxes as Mac is going to just put a reminder out there. Well, you know, uh, things kind of pile up. Uh, once I was so thrilled with this idea of carving into a copper plate with Buren, uh, after the Dundas sculpture was put in place a few years ago, uh, I did a, an engraving of that structure, but I call it the bugs and the birds finding a place to land. Because here's this metal thing that should be a tree, but it's hard to land on. and and, and stand on, and then it gets extremely cold too. But it, we'll be referring to this a little bit later. But I just really enjoy that, seeing that copper uh, curl up in front of the Buren. And as time went by, I uh, got to know John Moccasin. He was the one that hired me. He called me in Alberta, Canada and asked if we were interested in living in a warmer climate. And that that really took with Jackie and me and our two small children. But uh, he was in a serious accident, was severely burned. And then in his retirement, when he was getting well, he was continuing to paint these wonderful ribbon paintings. And uh, we decided one day, sitting in his barn with these paintings uh, on easels all around, that maybe we could do a show if he would let me create uh, sculptural images of how I saw his painting. So I started making these. And uh, meanwhile, John died, so we never had the exhibit. But I love to take inspiration from people who are standing right there in the hallway and, and 
people, especially who ask, what are you doing? And then we start talking and there's a project always. And I have a whole lot of things like watercolors. They actually had me teaching watercolor painting at St. Olaf's the first summer that we were here. And I love watercolor. I'd done it all through graduate school. But there were uh, people around me who really knew how to do it. And it, it always encouraged me to keep trying these things, but at the same time to uh, get advice and help from colleagues. Colleagueship was super important. But uh, in 1972, uh, I was looking for uh, plastic uh, windows, what sheet plastic, uh, what do you call it? And, uh, and the place where I got them to make storm windows for this house uh, also had a whole pile of black uh, plastic and uh, besides clear and blue, but they had 10 buckets of polyurethane foam that they were trying to dispose of, no charge. No, I only had to buy the colors and you won't see them here because I, I, you know, I don't have digital pictures of that, but uh, it turned out, right side up, yes, that uh, A. Gimsey makes a foam cone. So here was the uh, poetry, poetry coming into existence uh, and there were 20 of these panels uh, and of all the crazy things that uh, Arthur Campbell created some really zingy uh, music for this and some dancers from uh, Ann Wagner's dance class came and really put on a performance. Arthur was exquisite. I, I, I couldn't help but get zinged by the whole thing, never intending to do this, but it was one of those unexpected things. I think it probably didn't give me a, a great introduction to uh, the successor for Ar Arnold Flotten. Well, I know it, it didn't do that, but uh, just for fun, foam poem with poetry, poetry. It is the message of discovery, of gentleness by folds, of waves rolling under a shifting wind, of garments billow breezing, softly lured. It is the mind filled with fluffy potential, sea froth, skidding along the shore brow. It is the garden of the feminine form, slightly bruised by beating wing tips, then breathed on in overlapping puff, 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 puffs. And it, it goes on for quite a ways, but you get the gist, right? <laughs> uh, we, we had two uh, adorable children who have, have long since, uh, left this area, but uh, I was really excited because you can see them standing right there. And you, oh, there they are, right. Yeah, uh, we had spent a year on global and then uh, sabbatical in Taiwan. And uh, those two had, it was like their heads were glued together and they were such good friends. They went to school together. They, they were a great favorite of the students. Uh, wonderful, wonderful experience. So I did that to kind of uh, capture what I thought was their adventure with the two of us. And then uh, I thought, well, let's see, how can I uh, show you what this meant to me? Now, if you don't believe it, uh, that is Mac on that picture. It startles me too. But I want to show you that in case some of you knew me so long ago that you, you don't recognize me now. <laughs> Mac, we've got a question here. Um, have you always added poetry to each work of art? Uh, well, it, it started by uh, writing a long description of what I thought. And it evolved into poetry. And was reinforced by having uh, musician friends. And I will be quoting some of that uh, along the way. And it turned out that there were two pieces that were composed for the St. Olaf Band. One of them, uh, with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in April of 
2019. Uh, and the other one was in 2011, Mother Teresa, and then uh, two with the St. Olaf Choir. And uh, Ralph Johnson composed those, and uh, or composed uh, one of them, uh, sorry, and Dan Coleman the other. Uh, working with the musicians really helped me out because I recognized that every syllable requires a sound. And in music, that does influence how you write the poetry. And so I tried to think in terms of uh, the cadence, a rhyme, a rhythm. Uh, and, and by putting it to music, they taught me how it should have been written. Because we worked a lot on, on getting the, the, uh, the notes to fit the sound. And uh, I just had no idea about doing all that, except that when I was uh, diverted into a philosophy course at McAllister uh, in my youth, I, I met a man named Sia Armajani, and I knew his wife, Barbara uh, Bauer. And uh, Sia read some of the poetry that I had been writing that had nothing to do with art. And he took 26 of them and published them on a mimeograph machine and sold them in the library at McAllister. And he and Barbara ever since have really encouraged me in, in that direction and we shared over the years. And they're godparents to our son, Chris. So uh, I, I could carry on with those two for quite a long time, but they were very encouraging too when this whole art thing came up and advised me on how to do it. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> See, that, that's good. I, I need a prompting, and and I've got one. And uh, here we go. Now, uh, also along the way, and I have no idea exactly when any of this happened, but when that footbridge was put in across uh, the Cannon River in downtown Northfield, I designed a, a sculpture for it, and these were forms I hadn't tried yet, uh, but it was dancing across the cannon. It was the name of it. And these were to be uh, steel, uh, welded steel pieces that look a, an awful lot like uh, other pieces that I've done lately. But then I did many drawings. And the idea was you'd walk under it. And uh, I never showed it to anybody because one of my friends said, you know how much that's going to cost. <laughs> and it, but it turns out that these forms have appeared in all kinds of ways in my later sculpture in Dundas and in other places. So, uh, you know, I'm, I've been conscious of downtown Northfield wanting to do something like that, but I also know that there are tricks to public art that you don't uh, always anticipate. And one of them, and anybody could say this would be a danger to the mountain climbers. Uh, but along the way, uh, uh, Christy Clark, uh, signed up for a CMAC grant to do a piece of sculpture with uh, Northfield uh, high school artists. And it was a sheer joy. I could not believe the fun we had. And uh, we acquired these huge blocks of wood, uh, eight feet long, uh, 10 by 10 inches wide, 10 students had eight of them, they teamed up <clears throat> and uh, put their impression of what it was like to live in uh, Northfield and in our current world. And on, in, I also came across uh, a dozen uh, piece, uh, what it, bamboo poles from 10 to 12 feet long. So they each made a flag that they put on top of those. So it's over 20 feet tall. And in the wind, those, we didn't know this, those flags fluttered. They're made out of thin aluminum and, and made just a wonderful racket. Uh, but, and, and nobody complained and, and tore it down, but it's called the Tree of Knowledge and Delight. And each of them participated in the, for, we had four months to uh, create this with models and visiting artists in the community. I, I can't imagine having more of a privilege. And, not, and there was no sculpture program at the time. And so it, it's still carrying on with Karna Hauk and others, but, uh, what a blessing to have to do something like this without grading. Ha <laughs> ha. Anybody agree? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, pardon? 
Oh yeah, sculpture. Well, I do have just a couple more. One is uh, after 9-11, I designed, it's really hard to see, but I designed a massive fountain called the Fountain of Unity of All Faiths. And I, I didn't know where to put it, but uh, I made a model. And it, and these are the only digital pictures I could find and the model is gone. But then uh, the idea was Come to this flowing fountain to absorb its lively presence. Let the color of the stones and the sounds of water remind you of the dreams you had held on to as night became day. And your vision for a new clear light grew clear. We gather quietly on the wings of our flying minds to land by this fountain of remembrance where chaos and continuity form a touch of many fingers to settle with gentleness of movement never to end where your freshest fountain of youthfulness flows within you always. Well, I was thinking of students and what they were going through at the time and others as well. And it, I'm only uh, quoting small parts of it. That one I haven't memorized. Okay, now to sculpture. Wow. There came a time when uh, I was really concerned about the way the world was going, and uh, yeah, you can see. You this. can tip it down just a little tip bit. Just a little. Here we go. Yep, there you go. Right, you, right. Uh, just a smidge more. Oh, oh see, this there. is why. Okay, I mean, there. Well, yeah, you, I don't want you to see me. I want the sculpture. Yeah, and uh, as I turn it, you can see the forms. It's called Abraham Burger, and it's Abraham standing under the golden arches, about to make a Big Mac out of Isaac. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen this and from the back side you see the, the back side of Isaac and the Paschal lamb but on the top there's a parent and a child bird both of them saying Abraham you do not need to do this and uh, the uh, the intent of this is not to be funny but well partly to get your attention uh, when James Huberty kissed his wife goodbye and uh, told his two daughters, uh, 10 and 12, that he would not be back. He walked into uh, the San Isidro McDonald's where there were 45 people. He shot 21 dead and 19 were wounded. Only five escaped down the staircase uh, and hid. And he was killed by a sniper as he approached the doorway and it was discovered that he was seriously mentally ill. He was seeking help at a clinic which ignored him. And this, in my mind, was the beginning of this era, just horrible era, of having no intervening voice to say, you do not have to do this. Now, each day, we are faced with this. So, good. Another, another one I called Daka, and you won't be able to see this. Let's see if I'm back a little here. Uh, very well, but there's a bronze figure in this containment area, and it's a, 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 actually the floating body of a child and uh, that is being sacrificed for whatever rule of uh, law and mismanagement there is among, in humanity or even though only attempts to right the, the ills. But uh, as you look in here, you will see, because the way I tilted all the mirrors, they multiply to infinity. So where there is one child in danger, uh, there are many, many dozens and hundreds more. And uh, I will, uh, the concluding poetry deals with this. And uh, I also uh, realized that, uh, well, I wanted to do a show called Sacrifice, Sacred or Profane, uh, Human or Divine. And so this was the sign for it. It was opened in the spring of 1976. And a student who was the editor of the Viking Yearbook and I tried to figure out a way to put all these into a, some kind of a brochure. And 
Mark Bretheim figured it out. 20 pieces are here. And on this side, you turn around another 20 pieces. And each one of them has a commentary that can lead to poetry. But the trick that Mark came up with is when this is open, it stands up. A piece of sculpture stands up. So he taught me that way into 1985, uh, after a sabbatical, and I had a chance to team up with a whole lot of faculty to put on a Mercy concert. There were two programs that were uh, in Ernest Recital Hall. And I, I mean, I really combed not only the fine arts faculty, but other people to uh, participate in this. And I just want to mention one of them. Uh, it, it's called The Dove Descending Breaks the Air. It's a, uh, the words are by T.S. Eliot, number four of Little Gidding uh, in the four quartets, music by Igor Stravinsky, 1962, by the repertory singers with Gerald Hoekstra, director. Well, when he asked me what I was doing one time, I told him about this and I said, well, you have a group that can perform here. And there was dance and other people reciting uh, things. And oh, and well, music uh, all the way through. How much could I be in the best possible element? Then, and, I, and I'm saying this uh, as my joy to have a career in a, well, I want to say liberal arts environment that encouraged me to do this kind of thing. And I did have several grants to uh, produce the sculpture over that time. And, oh, uh, just not a, a quick drop back is to show you uh, something that some of you may have. It's called Christus Victor. It's a very small crucifix. And uh, Sister Shelby, you have one of these. And if you don't mind, I'll tell you, there were a thousand of these cast in one year. Uh, Jay Domeyer, one of my sculpture students, you know, put all of these together and we cast them in the, the, the foundry at St. Olaf. He did a mammoth job. And uh, these were offered to uh, people who you know, gave some gift to the college. And they, they disappeared rather quickly, but uh, and I was glad for that. But the idea with this small version is that you hold it in your hand and, and it warms up. And the first place that I used this happened to be at my beloved uh, brother-in-law Jim's funeral. So it was passed through the audience for everyone to bid farewell to Jim. And by the time it got to Sister Shelby's hand, it was warm by everyone there. So, but I didn't anticipate doing this. It just, it rose up from the moment. And I just have so much uh, inspiration from so many sources that when an idea came, I, I hung on to it. And this is not your normal cross. Um, it, it took yet another form. Uh, about 20 inches high. And the idea is that <clears throat> this figure is glued to the tree, but trying to separate from it. Hands raised up, uh, grace flows down through what I call Christ the conduit, into the ground, into the, uh, the people of God to nourish them. So it was really animated and really rough. So, because he's breaking away from the tree. And uh, that moved on to one, this is larger. Actually, uh, I tried to break into Bill and Char Carlson's house to get the original of this, but I forgot the garage door number. Uh, and they're in DC, so I'm not, you know, <laughs> well, nobody has to tell them. Anyway, this is a picture of a larger piece that is uh, that high. And, and this is the one that was cast in bronze that uh, the college gave to the Vatican in Rome. And the presentation took place in the Pauline Chapel, which was across from the Sistine Chapel with two groups of St. Olaf 
students there, and uh, two uh, frescoes by Michelangelo, one of Paul, one of St. Peter. And the, the man who had gotten an honorary doctorate from St. Olaf uh, was there, Johannes Cardinal Willebrand, the prelate of the Netherlands, but also the president of the uh, Council on Spiritual Unity of the Vatican, along with, I mean, honestly, <laughs> talk about quivering in your shoes, uh, along with Archbishop von Lerda, the, the uh, uh, vicar general of the whole Vatican who commissioned the Sistine ceiling to be clean. Whoa. Now, just so you don't feel like I was naked and alone, uh, Gracia, our daughter, was with us, and she had, uh, the last year, uh, spent a year in uh, Belgium you know, studying in a foreign school and learning Dutch. When we went to lunch after, she led the conversation. How relieved can you be that your child rescues you when you really need it? Okay. <laughs> Matt, now, we've got a question um, yes. is that you're um, you're really inspired by contemporary social issues and you pull yeah. from historical and biblical contexts in your artistic reflections. Sure. Can you tell us more about why you uh, utilize that approach? Oh, OK. Uh, well, uh, this, by the way, if you happen to be at Luther Seminary, it's a much larger uh, uh, Y-shaped crucifix that I did and dedicated to a student, a St. Olaf student who was going to law school and seminary at the same time, and he uh, disemboweled himself, and it was tragic. I, I dedicated, I was inspired and dedicated to do this in, in his honor. So, whew, good. Yeah, uh, let's see. I've got, uh, oh, you'll, you'll like this. This is called uh, Moses in the Mushroom Cloud. And it's hard for you to see, it's small. It's almost like a grenade, oh yeah, yeah. And it, it's Moses uh, who, you know, was, had a stammering problem and uh, didn't want to be in charge of anything. And uh, so I was 10 years old when the bombs went off in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And my father had been in the Air Force, but was on a brief leave, as I understand it. And uh, he did not have to go back. But uh, the idea is that Moses saw the burning bush and it didn't burn up. So I have him standing in the mushroom cloud. And here it is. But he doesn't burn. And so, uh, and then here's, here he is looking at the new law of Xerox, you could say, or uh, facts, but it says the nuclear law or the new clear law to love your neighbor as yourself or kiss your neighbor goodbye. Now, the poetry for this uh, <clears throat> talks the, about uh, never again, ever more children of the nuclear holocaust. And, uh, I'm inspired by this piece and, and the whole idea because nuclear uh, warfare has not been used since uh, 1945, August of 1945. And we've had threats all along the way. So I want to refer to this as one of those huge issues that we have to deal with, especially with North Korea in the mix. So and I, I, <clears throat> I read a lot uh, and I subscribe to uh, some magazines that, oh boy. And also, I, I talk to people, especially those who are standing, <coughs> excuse me, next to me. Uh, does that get, give you a start on an answer? <coughs> I hope so. <coughs> also, uh, there are things that, that you don't expect. I, <coughs> I happen to be in New York City when <coughs> Now, uh, because of Guernica uh, was there, right side up, <clears throat> there were hardly any people in the room, and I, I could sit on the floor and study it just a few feet away. And now it's in uh, the Reina Sofia in Madrid, 
<coughs> and you get to march through or across the room and you have a limited time, <coughs> everybody moves on. Is there anything I can do for my throat, honey? <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm not you know, accustomed to yelling so much, but I want to tell you that <coughs> along the way, Jimmy Carter was coming to campus as a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And I had this friend named Wendell Arneson. Hi, Beth. Uh, I don't know if Wendell's there. He doesn't have to be. I, I don't think I told him I was going to do this. Huge. This is a 12 foot by 28 foot painting of village. And here is chaos. And here is calm. The most magnificent, huge painting I can imagine. And it was just, as it turned out, it was just slightly larger oh, than uh, Picasso's Guernica. And uh, I found a book in Madrid that had you know, 420 uh, photos of Guernica. So I spent a while uh, cutting them out and gluing them onto cardboard. So I, I have it life size. And maybe some of you even saw it. I think Pat Van Wyland was at a Melby in 2001. And that was the centerpiece. Well, uh, I, I haven't studied Picasso as much in depth as I have uh, since seeing this because everything about it is just, uh, Picasso is just screaming to pay attention to something that happened that he knew was illegitimate. Wendell had, when he painted this, whew, I mean, it was a huge task. And then it took, uh, Christy Hawkins and Greg Manning quite a while to put this up on the stage when uh, Carter was here. But he commented that he had never seen anything like that in his life. And I tried to give him a quick synopsis, but someone you know, pulled him away. But the, uh, it, 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 here it is. Whew. Thanks, Wendell. You got my heart, man. <clears throat> so, uh, and then, I'm looking over the pile here. How, how are we doing? Oh, well, we're getting toward the end. So I better just show a couple of things. Uh, one is Mother Teresa squeezing life into a child. And the piece is right there. Can you see it? Right here? Yep, we can see it. Okay, good. Uh, oh, yeah. First, I make a small one. This is the Mac et concept. And this one I finished enough to cast in bronze. And then into this shape. And this does not belong to me. I hope you can hear me when I look at it. It belongs to my sister Shelby. She and her husband. Uh, this is the, the original of it. And then we made a plaster mold and cast it in bronze, Jeff Barber did. Uh, and it's uh, now in the, uh, I guess it's Augsburg University Chapel. And so thank you, Sister Shelby. I call it a canopy of grace that uh, shows the whole motive of Mother Teresa, who is now Saint Teresa, that she is uh, resurrecting or saving a, a child at birth with tremendous strength in her in her uh, arms and her legs. This is not the diminutive four foot eleven Mother Teresa, and we did see her in Kolkata when we were visiting the uh, hospital for the dying elders. And uh, she she didn't stop to say hello, but she was a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, so she was on my list. And uh, I stood next to Tim Marr one day and he said, what are you doing? And I told him, and so here, Chris and I are presenting it at the band concert in the, October, in the fall of uh, the homecoming in 2011. And, uh, and Sister Shelby, you were there. It was such a joy to present that. So the, uh, the title is Try to Praise the Mutilated World. Wherever you find it, in all the places you walk, where there, there are those who suffer, so hold them in your wakefulness 
close at hand. The bitterness of women is felt in their abuse with their children being held captive without human help. Oh yeah. Search the shattered psyche of the suicide killer, mindless of injury or age, and hopeless for those who are innocent in every way. Then run your fingers through the silt of the desert where armies have dumped their mutilated dead, no breath no voice to claim their futile glory. Our vision of humanity with its triumphs and its tragedies lets the healing world begin because we care about the mutilated world and try to praise all the living and loving hearts so near us. Try to praise the mutilated world. Just a couple. Is, is it starting to work? Okay. <laughs> um, I do, uh, I have to uh, finish up, but I, I also want to mention that I stood next to Timothy Marr another time and he asked what I was doing. So in April of <clears throat> 2019, this. Uh, Bronze piece was presented with the band and uh, with the, the musical piece too. And uh, I did, I really need to show you this because uh, David Clark, who was the music, is the music man at Normandale Lutheran Church in Edina. And he's living here in Northfield now. Uh, but he knew uh, you know, Charlie Rudd, who had been in Northfield, and uh, also uh, Dan Coleman. So uh, Dan wrote a piece uh, called Never Again, Ever More Children of the Nuclear Holocaust. And it was performed at Normandale Lutheran Church, but it just turned out that Ralph Johnson and his sophomore roommate, Anton Armstrong, were in the audience. And so uh, you know, Dan was asked to convert it to be sung with the uh, St. Olaf Choir. And, and it was premiered in... Uh, the Ordway, and then the choir sang it in Japan and South Korea that summer. And oh, every time I hear these things set to music, I, I just am thrilled that the, the sculpture, good, okay. Uh, the poetry, fine. When it's set to music, it enters a realm I cannot reach on my own. Wow, okay. And then, yeah. Are you go, Mac? Are you going to the On Horizons? Yep, that's it. Perfect. That okay? Good. And and then I'll just show you. Here's uh, I, years ago I designed a logo for Dundas, and they put it on the water tower. Uh, April Ripka, some sketchy artist, uh, digitized it for me. I didn't know how to do that. And then the mayor asked me to create something. So here's the. Uh, now, uh, let's see, here's the, the model, and then uh, here's the piece. And I'm showing you this because a friend of ours uh, was here a few years ago, and he uh, looked at the Dundas piece and said, uh, what else have you got? <laughs> so uh, I showed him first the uh, bronze that I did for the 2009 uh, Peace Prize Forum that had the poetry on Horizon's Brim. And uh, I also built a 12 foot piece here in the living room. It was winter and cold in the garage. And uh, so this was uh, presented on behalf of Al Gore and uh, intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. And uh, it started with a lot of drawings. Then a small model, a little larger model adding color, and a four foot 
model that I can't get off of my porch and in here to show you. So here's the picture of it. And then, yeah, from there, I made many, many drawings, but uh, I also did color panels to add color. There are actually four of these, and I will turn you this way so you can see the next phase on the wall where I, are they all there? Yeah, rotate back just a little bit. Just a um, little, oh, there it is, yeah. There we go, that's perfect. Yeah. So yep. I, I did larger versions of this to make sure the colors, uh, red, uh, red, yellow, uh, blue, and then only one, uh, well, the, the primary colors plus one complementary, and uh, sent it to a computer designer at TMCO Industries in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And here's what I got back. I can't do this myself. Mike Peterson was a genius. And then uh, it turned out that uh, we made a 12-foot version. And then uh, they, they talked about what to do next. And the 24-foot is right up here, the mark. And at the base is uh, Roland Temme, the owner of the Metal Plus Arts Division of TMCO Steel. And well, I just had no idea they were going to do that. So they hired a, an engineer from uh, Meyer Borgman uh, Johnson in the cities, who was a St. Olaf grad, Colin O'Neill, who, uh, who was uh, on site engineer at Holland Hall during the renovation. And, and these are the two small legs and that's how they get it so that it will the weight will not tip it over and it will have total wind shear no matter where you put it and, uh, and then they order up all the pieces and especially the curved ones because they have to thin as they go up and these are laid out on the floor very complex process of welding and here's the crew that they gathered including Paul Krauss, where are you, Paul? And uh, who flew to do videos of, of this exercise in welding that was just stunning. And the first thing that I saw then was this, the two uh, middle, the, uh, the, I call them flames that meet in the, in the top. And you can see people right under there. And then, I just I had an opportunity to take Jackie to see it. Bless her heart. Can you see her? And here's the one that shows you the scale better than anything else I can show you. That uh, and it, it has on top the double dove of peace and love, uh, which is this. Uh, it's six feet long, and I won't tell you all the details about it, but uh, here's my model. I got a duck, and uh, it's got two beaks. One is down for when the bird uh, takes off, and one is up for when the bird lands, which we see out our back door. And then uh, these are supposed to be a little higher up, and you can see I'm experimenting with eyeballs here. But they put it into that metal, and it spins in the slightest breeze, it's just amazing. So uh, if you look up, you can look into the globe and then all these forms that weave around and it's, you can walk in and out and around it. And here's Paul taking a video. Can you see yourself there, Paul? And then there are different uh, variations of this with the the poetry, and then there's one last uh, larger version of this that got printed out. Uh, so, <clears throat> and I envisioned it from uh, seeing uh, solar, solar flares off the um, computer off the sun. 
And these were flaming up into the air and then they would every once in a while join, sometimes flare off independently. Such an inspiration. And, uh, and then I made them waving. Well, uh, first of all, in implying that they are planted in the soil and springing up out of the soil as well as plants, like blooming flowers year round, the, the, wherever you see it, it will be flashing colors that uh, will be beautiful. And, uh, and then the double dove of peace and love, uh, I made this bronze one for my grandchildren, uh, seven grandchildren, and uh, five years ago. And the idea is every time they spin it, they uh, should say a prayer for peace, make a wish for peace, uh, health for somebody, a, a calm day for themselves. And uh, along the way, uh, they, one of them said, well, several of them said to me, uh, well, I spin it every day, like you said, Baba, but I, I realized that every time I spin it, I think of you. Well, I melted. That was just way more than I anticipated. So uh, what I've done is I've created the uh, metal double dove of peace and love that I asked uh, TMCO, we haven't done this yet, to make 10 of them so I could give them to pieces to people who were involved in the project. And the idea, again, they're, they're curved so that uh, if the wind blows, they'll spin. But uh, to, uh, the idea is to make it in five pieces so that it fits into a, a box. And then uh, they said, well, you know, if you make 10, you can make 100. And this is all done by laser. So, and we'll put anything you want on the base, any uh, citation you want, because they do, they have a business of uh, making uh, awards. And, uh, well, we'll make a thousand, 10,000, whatever you want. That was a little past my memory, but I thought, okay, if thousands of these were around the world at any moment in the day or night, somebody would be making a wish for peace and spinning the double dove of peace and love and healing. But by spinning it, they would be referencing on horizon's brim with its double dove in motion whenever there was the slightest breeze. They would remember that uh, emanation point. So that's oh, okay. And uh, I, I've memorized the poetry. Uh, that's past this one. Uh, now I do it when I'm in the uh, Northfield Senior Center pool because <clears throat> there's loud music and a lot of exercise going on. And there's blood in my brain. I actually can remember some of it. So <clears throat> I would like to uh, quote it and I'll, I'll try to do just the, the uh, there are a lot of stanzas. I haven't completed it. I'm still working on the uh, reset from COVID and other incidences in, in our purview right today. But it's to honor those who are dying from COVID-19 and have died and all who attempted to rescue the, its victims. <clears throat> uh, for those in protest for Black Lives Matter, those locked in gender wars, families struggling in every direction and especially now the youth and DACA and for those who are showing uh, hard work for climate change and all who daily are striving for peace on horizon's brim. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to leave this here. Okay. <clears throat> Praise all who heal our hearts and bodies for those locked in illness, trapped and hiding, drifting, not and silent for those who have courage in our distance mode of danger with the risk of dying to help the dying far beyond our daily wager. Squeezed into leaving breathing, millions surge into global protest to remember those who in 
violence vanished. To fill our days of grieving with the images of those who suffer from unjust ice. Children dash on to the streets looking for a place to stand, a safe place to stand, where their, their right to life is lost by origin of color. Then come the perils of brutality to silence, to shatter the silence of our night. My most urgent plea is for the yet unborn. How to keep each child safe from human harm, safe from loss of family and human and, and uh, proper parenting, safe from plunging into seas of refugees, then washing up face down on beaches of bitter rejection. Instead, to nurture them, to grow in wisdom and strength, and lead us onto common ground where soils are saturated by every mix of human blood and soaked down by human tears, that we might learn to sow our seeds of peace and healing into fields of a gentler faith, using all humanity's permission. Peace be with you. Thank you so much, Mac. We're going to uh, open it up to gallery view and okay. look at all of us that are just, wow, such a treat to be here and to hear thank you. all that you've shared with us tonight. And I just thank you. I, I want to open it up if there are some more questions. I know Kay had a great question about what piece would you um, create for today's for healing? And she said, you answered it with the with your last piece that you were showing. So um, I I'll also want to open it up. Are there other questions that people would like to ask? Now is the time. Wow. <laughs> Feel free to unmute or uh, send your question in the chat. Yeah, just uh, just a comment. Um, as the official filmmaker uh, for Mr. Gimsey, um, and I've been working on this project with him for about I don't know, Mac. Has it been about four years? Anyway, yeah. three or four years, and uh, hopefully we'll come to a conclusion this year, and we'll have a <laughs> premiere sometime in the fall of uh, On Horizons Brim. Um, and and I cannot begin to tell you how exciting it has been to work with this unbelievably talented, gifted, spirited artist. Uh, it is, uh, it's been just a great honor and a privilege to work with Mac. And uh, if there ever was a living treasure, folks, this, this is the guy. Uh, so I just want to just say that, you know, it's been, a, it's been just a, a marvelous journey of discovery when you're in the presence of, of genius and the presence of uh, a passionate artist, you can only be inspired. And so I'm so looking forward to presenting the story of this incredible sculpture uh, to all of you uh, later this year, because it is, it is really quite remarkable. So thank you, Mac. Well, what a journey it's been. And, and it is really strange to see yourself reflected through Paul's eyes because he sees things I have no clue about. Very scary, very scary things. Very scary. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. So I have a funny question. Uh, this is Kay Brown. Uh, oh, hi, yeah. yeah. A long time ago. Hi, oh, Mac. Galen oh. Brown, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, um, yeah. How do you continue to be optimistic 
you know, what is, what is your source of optimism? I mean, that was such a wonderful sculpture of the dove flying and the wow. story of your children and all that sort of stuff. Wow. But in today's world, it is so hard to continue to be optimistic. So I just kind of wanted to just throw that out. How do you, how do you manage to continue to be optimistic? Oh, well, that's a great question for any and all of us. One thing is, uh, <clears throat> I've lived long enough, you know, at age 85, I think, wow, what else can happen? And then it some else does happen. But uh, I saw along the way, things happen with humanity that rose so far above what I saw. And, and it started way back with uh, you know, Dr. Schweitzer, yeah, when he got the Peace Prize in the fall of 1952. I was a senior in high school, and I wrote a paper on that, uh, his, his book, uh, Reverence for Life. And uh, it, it struck me that someone with that much talent, and it turned out my father loved his organ music, and there happened to be recordings on his own instrument, I heard them all the time. What on earth could motivate him to do what he did? And it was, it, it was a form of optimism that, uh, and I could go on and on about Schweitzer, but that, uh, that was an initial uh, impetus to try to think beyond what the situation was. And World War II was huge. And then uh, I've been trying to reset from COVID. And the, the things that are happening are actually quite remarkable. That I, I'm hearing people say, um, some of the things that have occurred that are just beyond what we would expect of humans to be uh, heroes, uh, and not just heroes, but looking out for other people. And, you know, then, then uh, George Floyd happens. And, and I have a piece for George Floyd as well. And it, it stems from apartheid in South Africa way, way back. But I, I want to look at them as they are, and then try my best not to accept that they can't uh, go beyond the terrible consequences that they've uh, created for humankind, you know. But that's, oh, perfect question, wow. And I pray a lot, and I, I ask Jackie to help me think every day. And it's pretty amazing how someone else can reflect on what you're thinking in ways that lead you to something positive. And I, I ask people. So I'll ask you the same question, Kay, but let's get together and have some Swedish meatballs or something. <laughs> Is that okay? So far? Okay. I just have a quick one, Mac. Uh, oh, this sure. is Steve Watson from Minneapolis. And um, as oh, heavy yeah. as the wow subject areas that you've brought up, always lacing it with that dry humor of yours. <laughs> it's, so that's the optimism that she was talking about too. And I have to share this with, uh, I think I shared it with, with you once, but I had to share it with the other group because 1971, when I am struggling through uh, drawing the anatomy, the muscular anatomy with Arch Leon, uh, at St. Olaf, and in walks Mac with a funnel on his head, uh, <laughs> and I, it was such a setup for lightning, lightening up what we were struggling with that day, so anyway, I, I just remember the cartoon of Tom Terrific, who had a funnel on his head, and um, here's Tom Terrific coming in to teach a little bit of our class, so Thank you. Oh, Steve, I'm so glad you're here. It, yes. And, and I learned that at an early age from a, a crazy Sunday school teacher who turned out to be Mary Carlson's father. Uh, and she's the head of uh, social work here at St. Olaf. I love her dearly. And, uh, and he, he taught me that Adam, in Sunday school that Adam and Eve's telephone number is 381 Apple. Or 28. See, I got it wrong. Math is terrible. 281 Apple. And there were and there were jokes like that all the time. My parents didn't know what to think, but we would follow him anywhere. <laughs> and I did want to say also, uh, it, uh, this is really good. Uh, <clears throat> I, I really don't know how to say 
the uh, bedrock inspiration that I've gotten from students and colleagues at CINO from traveling dozens of times around the world with wonderful people and going to Mother Teresa's uh, different uh, hospitals and uh, orphanages and seeing our young people respond and, and shedding tears with the kids there. And just, I, I don't know how I ever could establish that kind of a career if I tried to think ahead, it wouldn't work. And there you were, Steve, you were doing your thing in the art department. Every little piece of what I am, can, uh, I feel, comes from, uh, in terms of immediacy, from that uh, walking the campus with Howard Hong, good Lord. And, uh, you know, it just, it, it's just, to me, it's stunning what a rich environment. environment. Wow, this has been just an inspirational, wonderful journey that you've taken us on tonight, Mac. Thank you so much for all the time that you spent and all the people that helped you get this together. Um, this has just been such a treat. Um, if, if folks have things that they would like to talk with Mac that came up, um, he, uh, it's gimsy at stoloff.edu. Uh, welcomes an email from you to continue the conversation. Um, thank you so much for being here. This has just been wonderful. And if you want to unmute, let's give Mac a round of applause. Like this is such a one <laughs> a fun <laughs> night. Yay! Well, and, and thank you, thank you, Heather, for doing such a terrific job of putting oh, this together. This is my cool. pleasure. So, and thank you to the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, this has just been a really a really wonderful night. And thank you. And again, this recording will be up. Um, on the interwebs at some point here coming up. So uh, spread the word. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Mac, and special hi to Jackie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. yeah. I'll, I'll kiss and hug her. Love you. <laughs> thank you. It was wonderful. Oh, good. Thanks, Mac. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks. <laughs> this Bye. was more fun than I ever planned on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mac. There you go. There's Jackie. Okay. <laughs> Recovering. Thank you, Mac. You're welcome, everybody. Uh, <laughs> thanks for sticking with me, boy. That's awesome. Uh, but thank you, Mac. Have a good night. You're thank welcome. you. We loved it. Oh, good. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> night. <laughs> night, night. Yeah. I learned things about my brother that I had never known. <laughs> That's my sister Shelby talking. If you don't. <laughs> Well, oh, sorry. Well, you were a, a, an, an example for me on how to do things right. And, <laughs> and however it happened that I got off track, I'm not sure, but you were so tolerant of me and it helped <laughs> and encouraging. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mac. Yeah, good. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hurry back. <laughs>